Last night, I experienced a disturbing situation involving an elderly woman who had fallen at her home. As a paramedic with eight years of experience, I never imagined witnessing such a lack of empathy and selfishness. Allow me to share this story in the hope of conveying the seriousness of what happened. We received a call to attend to a 75-year-old lady who had fallen at home. Upon arrival, we encountered a peculiar situation as the house was a duplex, with the patient's door on the right and the neighbor's on the left. The patient was lying on the floor, conscious but complaining of a severe headache. During the assessment, we noticed significant swelling and a bruise on the side of her head. When we asked her about the use of anticoagulants due to a previous stroke, she confirmed. Concerned about the possibility of a cerebral hemorrhage from the fall, we insisted on taking her to the hospital for precautionary exams. She agreed, and we began preparations for her transport. However, the situation took an unexpected turn when the neighbor, whom I'll call Karen, intervened disrespectfully. While we were getting ready to leave with the patient, Karen opened the door and complained about the brightness and noise caused by our presence. Even after explaining the emergency situation, she remained uncooperative. When Karen realized that the patient was her neighbor, her attitude turned into an extreme display of selfishness. She began yelling, refusing to allow us to take the lady to the hospital, claiming she needed her to care for her children the next day. My lieutenant reiterated the priority of the patient's health, but Karen, completely lacking compassion, simply slammed the door in our faces. We thought the situation had come to an end, but we were mistaken. Karen continued to act absurdly and unlike anything I had seen in my career. After a few minutes, while we were at the back of the ambulance, we decided that my lieutenant would take the team back to the station, and I would stay to monitor the patient's vital signs. I administered an intravenous injection and started the fluid infusion, reflecting on the coldness and selfishness I witnessed that night. Amidst my astonishment, I remain perplexed by the indifference shown by Karen, a situation that unfortunately highlights a lack of compassion in crucial moments. My colleague exited the back and went to the driver's seat. About five seconds later, the rear doors of the ambulance opened, and there stood Karen, obviously taking a few minutes to get dressed before coming out. At this point, I was almost out of patience and shouted, asking what on earth she thought she was doing. However, she simply retorted, saying that she had already warned that we couldn't take the patient to the hospital because she needed her to take care of her children the next day. She started trying to remove the ambulance key with the patient inside. Fortunately for us, she didn't know how to unlock the lock and couldn't remove the key. Our patient stated that she couldn't take care of Karen's children the next day because she had fallen and might be having a stroke. However, Karen shouted at her, insisting that she was fine and didn't need to go to the hospital because she wasn't having a stroke. At that moment, my partner heard the commotion and went to the back of the ambulance. He removed her from the path, and I closed and locked the doors. It was then that we realized Karen was about to become aggressive. It's worth noting that the police or sheriff also respond to our calls, especially at night in the area we were in. It took a few minutes for the sheriff to arrive, but he showed up in time. I couldn't hear much through the door, but I saw the officer coming out of his vehicle with a taser in hand. My partner ran back to the driver's seat and began driving to the hospital. The last sight I had through the rear windows was Karen advancing toward the officer and falling to the ground after getting shot, which, to be honest, was quite satisfying to watch. Talking to my patient, I asked what had happened. She explained that Karen's neighbor simply left her three children at her house for several hours without notice. My patient didn't even know she was supposed to take care of the kids because Karen never paid attention to her, only concerned with herself. It's absurd how someone can try to obstruct an ambulance when we were trying to take a patient to the hospital, especially in the face of the threat of a possible stroke. In my opinion, Karen deserved the shock because she was literally preventing the lady from seeking medical help, all for selfish reasons. She just wanted her free babysitter to take care of her children again, without notice and for free. This is not fair to anyone involved, but at least justice prevailed when the police intervened. I hope that this Karen learns a lesson and doesn't repeat the madness of obstructing an ambulance in an emergency situation. Things have deteriorated significantly. I filed a small claims lawsuit, and they had to reimburse me for the costs of theft, property damage, and emotional distress due to constant harassment, in addition to the expenses related to the legal process itself. The total sum was approximately $500.
This outcome finally made my sister and brother-in-law step back and effectively take care of their children. My nephews lost all their privileges and were compelled by a judge to perform community service they deeply disliked. They were forced to complete just over 100 hours each, as their parents reimbursed me when we reached an agreement outside of court. The judge expedited the case considerably. My nephews ended up doing tasks like collecting trash and working in local parks, under the supervision of a retired sergeant. It wasn't fun for them. The eldest nephew consistently demonstrated resistance to authority, engaging in arguments with anyone who told him to work. His father had to be called to make him pick up a simple rake. He openly blamed me for his situation, and initially, his brothers supported him. However, over time, they realized he was simply unbalanced and incorrect, deciding not to follow him anymore. The two younger nephews stopped following his example when they realized how misguided they were. The problem is that my sister and brother-in-law held me responsible for the division in their family. The situation did not end well for them, as no one in the family supported their stance. All criticism was directed at them and their misconduct, without me being blamed. They remain silent and resentful. Half of the family doesn't even want to associate with them, and now their own children are divided because the eldest refuses to change. The situation worsened to the point where my eldest nephew took an incredibly foolish action. In the middle of the night, he broke into my house with hammers that belonged to his father. And I say a pair because he literally held one in each hand. The first thing he did was break the new lock on my shed. This time, he didn't break it but severely damaged it to the point of being unusable, and I had to remove it with pliers. He also caused significant damage to the shed door with the claws of the hammer. I woke up to the sound of hammers and called the police when I peeked through the window and saw someone outside attacking the shed. I didn't realize at first that it was him because his face was covered by a scary mask. He saw the bedroom lights turn on and threw one of the hammers through my window, shattering glass everywhere. Luckily, I didn't injure my feet during this incident because I was barefoot. My nephew then started hammering the back door, causing significant damage by breaking the handle and window of the door, and tearing the door itself with the claws of the hammer. Worried about the safety of the door, I yelled that the police were on their way, and he fled before they arrived. Now, after the first incident, I installed several cameras, and night vision confirmed it was him. He was wearing a mask, but he also had on the school sweatshirt, his Nike sneakers, quite identifiable since his brothers don't have a matching pair. His fingerprints were on the hammer he threw through my window. My nephews had already been fingerprinted when they were previously arrested, so the police compared the fingerprints on the hammer, confirming they were his. When the police came to pick up my eldest nephew, he vehemently denied it, even though there was no one else who could be responsible. The other hammer was found in his room, along with the clothes and mask he was wearing. All of this was used as evidence. In this specific situation, the parents of this boy did nothing to protect him, nor did they try to blame me. They simply allowed their son to be taken, screaming incessantly. I wasn't present during the arrest, but my sister told me that my eldest nephew alternated between crying, claiming innocence, and shouting that everything was my fault, swearing revenge against me. The boy had to undergo a serious mental health assessment and was considered possibly bipolar. However, this does not justify his actions. Even after being diagnosed as bipolar and starting treatment, he continued to blame his mistakes, acting as if he was defamed only for receiving help. Eventually, he spent a month in the juvenile center, where he was properly medicated. He pleaded guilty, waived the trial again in exchange for more community service, mandatory counseling, and probation. This time, his father personally came to my house, replacing the broken window and door. However, he barely uttered a word to me. While I was making repairs, my two younger nephews still excluded the older brother from their lives. He didn't apologize for the attack on my house. Unfortunately, he is repeating the school year due to the severity of his situation, with falling grades. His parents are unhappy with my two younger nephews, who came alone in July to personally apologize to me. They said they followed the older brother's example, making everything seem fun. However, they realize that the punishments are not worth the supposed fun and want to distance themselves from that. They want their fun uncle back and asked to start over. I agreed but made it clear that they would need to regain my trust, and they happily agreed. 
My eldest nephew turned 17 a few months ago and basically received nothing as part of his punishment. Not even a cake. This was part of the consequences for his actions. I imagine the financial cost he imposed on his parents just in the last year. He let them to steal from me and then destroy the window and back door of my room. Considering the previous legal action and the replacement of the door and window, the total cost must have exceeded a thousand dollars. Doors and windows are not cheap. Meanwhile, my younger nephew got a new mountain bike among his birthday gifts, a month after the incidents. This really bothered my eldest nephew, and he cut the bike tires with a kitchen knife, which, as you can imagine, got him into even more trouble. With some knowledge of bike repairs, I went there and bought new inner tubes and tires for the bike, installing them myself to ensure it was in good condition. My nephew was very grateful for me fixing it. However, he decided to run away, as he was no longer tolerated at home. He left, took his bike and a backpack full of belongings, leaving a farewell letter blaming me and his bipolar disorder for all the problems. He claimed he couldn't wait until he turned 18 to distance himself from all of us, considering that he was doing us a favor by getting rid of himself earlier. However, he returned three days later, without his bike or backpack, seemingly downcast. He refused to tell what happened, and to this day, we don't have all the answers. However, he seemed to have many doubts about constantly using me as a scapegoat for his personal problems. Upon returning, he continued blaming me, but I wasn't responsible for his actions, thefts, or attacks on my house. He almost returned to the juvenile center for violating probation, but somehow escaped easily. Currently, he spends most of his time in his room, unless he's at school, doing household chores, or attending counseling sessions. Although he completed community service, probation will persist until he turns 18. He received some leniency due to the bipolar diagnosis, but it didn't exempt him completely from consequences. He has tried many times to use his diagnosis as an excuse for his actions, something that is not common for people living with the same mental condition throughout their lives without committing similar acts. With my two younger nephews, I have been able to resolve things, but I keep my distance from the older one, and the feeling is clearly mutual. I met him personally only once in the last few months, and he looked at me with more hatred than I've ever seen from anyone before leaving. He can no longer portray me as a villain without being questioned, and there's not much he can do other than try to overcome it. Since the start of school, he has completely closed himself off, barely speaking, even at school. My other nephews have told me that he is being bullied and isolated, which will not contribute to his improvement. My relationship with my sister and brother-in-law is also strained, but I cannot be held responsible for their actions. They know that their poor parenting and lack of involvement were factors that forced them to become more active in their children's lives, something they should have done from the beginning. They complained about work fatigue and the need to supervise the children, so our recent conversations are awkward and forced. We no longer visit each other, but we meet at my parents' house, where our mother demands that we be civilized. However, with my two younger brothers, I have no problems. They have regained most of their privileges, the TV and video games have been returned, but the older nephew is not allowed to use them. I have been informed that he has some electronic entertainment in his room, although I don't know exactly what it is. His time is mostly spent there, unless he has obligations elsewhere. However, he is no longer welcome at any family events. Recently, my parents told me that they do not want to see him on Thanksgiving or Christmas Eve this year, due to his behavior in petty thefts. I understand the frustration, but even so, I consider this decision somewhat harsh. My sister and brother-in-law, despite also disagreeing, threatened to boycott family events if the nephew cannot participate. Personally, I cannot stand the presence of this boy in my house, so I understand the choice, although I believe that excluding him from everything and everyone may not be the best solution to help him. My eldest nephew will take a long time to rebuild relationships, if that is possible at the moment. The concern is that he may try to run away again when he reaches adulthood, unless the last attempt has scared him enough to give up. I sincerely hope things improve for him over time before it's too late to correct his behavior. Even though I don't appreciate him, he is still my nephew, and I genuinely care for him. However, I feel somewhat powerless to take any action. At the moment, the most I can do is stay on the sidelines and offer support when possible. This nephew seems like a complicated case, facing deep challenges. 
all the therapy and medication seem to have no desired effect. It's disturbing to see the futile attempts to help someone engaging in destructive behaviors. What's most surprising is the clear guilt of the parents and the eldest nephew. The rift caused by them and the family is significant, and they should be ashamed of their actions. It remains to be hoped that the eldest nephew can rebuild the broken bonds, as the current situation is unacceptable. To ensure a family future, he needs to act quickly. As for the inheritance, a complicated dilemma arises. Your great-grandmother, despite the financial difficulties faced by your grandmother, chose to allocate the inheritance exclusively to the great-grandchildren, including you and your brother. The situation becomes even more complex with your parents' adoption plans and the financial difficulties faced by the family. The decision on how to divide the money becomes a delicate matter, requiring careful consideration and understanding of everyone involved's needs. My relationship with my mother and grandmother is far from the best, and any act of generosity towards one of them can cause offense. Currently, I am inclined to allocate the money to my grandparents for various reasons, one of them being the fact that my grandfather is facing cancer, an absolutely terrible situation. From my perspective, the money should be primarily theirs. My grandmother has endured difficulties for years, while my grandfather often helped with car and home repairs for free. Nevertheless, my great-grandmother chose to reject them and decide that this inheritance would be allocated to the great-grandchildren. However, due to the tense relationship between my mother and my grandmother, my mother will likely feel rejected if I choose this option. I thought about distributing the money to both, but the question arises about balance and the division since a 50-50 split could leave my grandmother dissatisfied with receiving only half the amount for her cancer treatment, while the rest would be allocated to the adoption by my parents. Another alternative that crosses my mind is, paradoxically, keeping all the money for myself, thus avoiding any feelings of exclusion and concern. Family disputes are frequent on both sides, as everyone needs financial resources, and I anticipate that someone will be upset if they do not receive the money they believe they deserve. This is a truly distressing situation because I agree that my great-grandmother seems to act insensitively by prioritizing the great-grandchildren over her own children. However, it is essential to realize that, legally, the inheritance is yours, and the decision on how to use it falls on you. If you choose to donate money to the people involved, it's not an all-or-nothing choice. You can allocate part of the money, but it is crucial to remember that it is impossible to completely satisfy everyone. Regardless of what you decide to do, it is crucial to consider your own needs and priorities. Do not deprive yourself of justice. Although the intentions are noble in sharing or donating money, it is inevitable that not everyone will be completely satisfied. So, I suggest giving yourself some time and relieving stress, understanding that it is impossible to please everyone. Regarding the use of money to help your grandmother, it would certainly be beneficial to use it to support her cancer treatment. Personally, that would be my first choice in contributing to people's well-being. But for their parents, the idea of trying to adopt a child while facing financial difficulties seems strange. It is clear that they do not have the necessary resources to proceed with the adoption process, raising concerns about how they will be able to care for the child once they have it. Given what you have described, this specific situation seems to require more caution and consideration. The question persists as to whether, even after adoption, they will have the financial means to ensure the well-being of the child. However, the final choice is yours, as you are not obligated to donate the money if you do not wish to. I don't see it as selfish to state that you intend to use the money for your own future endeavors, regardless of the family's reaction of happiness or discontent. Thank you for following, and if you subscribe, remember to activate the bell to receive notifications. Keep listening to all the stories through the playlist at the top of the description. I appreciate everyone who has followed until the end of this video on the Histo Reddit channel. I hope you have enjoyed the shared stories. If you like the content, please share it with friends and family, subscribe to the channel, leave a like, and activate the notification bell to not miss any future videos. Your support is crucial for the channel's growth. Until next time.